In this video, we're going to get an overview of sentiment analysis in finance. Just a quick recap though, recall that we said NLP is essentially just a set of techniques which help us gain insights from text or indeed any other language data. Now if we think about sentiment analysis, well at least in finance, it essentially involves quantifying and exploiting sentiment or emotions for some sort of objective, be that investment um, or be it understanding firm performance, including profitability or cash flow management or the likelihood of fraud and so on and so forth. But ultimately it's about quantifying and exploiting sentiment uh, by linking it to firms, right? So we're trying to firstly estimate the level of sentiment uh, that firms have and then we're trying to link that to other attributes or characteristics of firms to try and see whether there's some sort of relationship with sentiment uh, and other firm characteristics. So if we think about what we mean by sentiment itself, well, it can include things like positivity or negativity, as well as uncertainty, narcissism, anxiety, panic, and so on and so forth. Essentially, it includes all of the things that you might think about when you think of the word sentiment. It's just that rather than thinking about it in terms of sentiment of humans, we're thinking about it in terms of sentiment of firms. So for example, the level of positivity of firms or the level of negative tone of firms, um, or you know the amount of uncertainty uh, that's being portrayed by firms, whether a firm CEO is narcissistic or humble, whether a firm is anxious about its future prospects, or you know even more broadly, whether an economy is currently facing some sort of panic. Right? So it's very much about the sentiment or emotion that you might know as a human. Um, it's just that we're applying it either to the firm level context or to some sort of aggregate macro level context. And in terms of how we actually go about using this sentiment uh, once we've estimated it, well, essentially we say if the sentiment matters, then we can use it to create some sort of trading strategy, for example. But importantly, when we're trying to find out whether sentiment matters, uh, we're not talking about whether I think sentiment matters or you know, whether you think sentiment matters. Uh, it's not about personal opinions or subjective thought or subjective debates. It's about letting the data determine whether or not sentiment matters. Right? So it's about using statistics to identify whether sentiment actually matters. And then if it does, so once we've established whether or not it matters, we can then use that to create some sort of trading strategy. So for example, if for instance, the returns of more positive firms are greater than those of less positive firms, then we can invest in more positive firms and short or sell the shares of less positive firms. Now at this stage, you don't really need to worry about how we go about estimating sentiment. So how we determine which firm is more positive and which firm is less positive. You're gonna learn how to do that later on. For now, the only thing you really need to take away is that say, for instance, we manage to estimate the level of positivity of firms, and then we find that you know the difference in positivities actually matters, then we could go about creating some sort of trading strategy. So specifically in this case, we would go long or buy shares of firms that are more positive and sell or short shares of firms that are less positive. And similarly, if we find, for instance, that uh, firms with narcissistic CEOs do better than uh, firms with humble CEOs, then you can invest in firms that are led by narcissistic CEOs and short firms that are led by humble CEOs, or indeed vice versa, right? So if for instance, we find that humble CEOs on average tend to outperform narcissistic CEOs, then we could invest in firms that are led by humble CEOs and short firms that are led by narcissistic CEOs. Again, at this stage, don't worry about how we actually go about measuring this sort of sentiment. It's just important that you understand it's not just about measuring uh, sentiment, it's also about validating whether or not the sentiment actually matters and only then going into things like whether we can exploit it uh, by creating some sort of trading strategy. And so crucially, the idea is to start with some sort of notion or a premise or an idea, or more formally, what's called a testable hypothesis, and then test or validate that hypothesis to see whether or not it holds. And this applies to any sort of analysis, right? So it's not limited to uh, just sentiment analysis. When you're conducting any sort of analysis, the best thing you can do is to start with some sort of testable hypothesis and then test and validate uh, whether or not that hypothesis holds, right? So let the hypothesis drive your analysis process. And so when we think about sentiment analysis as well, we wanna let the hypothesis ultimately drive uh, the analysis process. 
And so what we've done is we've created what we call a five-step sentiment analysis process. But I do want to be clear that although we've created this sort of five-step process, it's important to know that the real world isn't necessarily always so systematic, right? So things can, in fact, get messy. But if we were to think about some sort of systematic uh, approach to sentiment analysis, well, here's what a five-step process might look like. Right, so again, we're going to start with perhaps the most important part, which is to create a testable hypothesis. And we're going to talk about what we mean by a testable hypothesis specifically uh, in a lot more detail in another video. For now, you can just think of it as a formalized version of our idea or notion that we're looking to test. Right, so it's just a way of formalizing our beliefs or what we think might be true uh, and expressing it in a way that we can test uh, empirically. And once you have this testable hypothesis, you can then think about extracting relevant data. And in the context of sentiment analysis, because we tend to work with text data, the relevant data is some sort of corpus, right? So corpus is essentially the entire sample of text data that you're going to be working with. And of course, to determine whether the data is relevant, we really want to go back to step one and let the hypotheses drive that, right? So if, for instance, your hypothesis is whether uh, more positive firms outperform less positive firms, then the data that's most relevant is some sort of firm level data, right? So it might be annual reports, for instance, or it might be interview transcripts of management or, or the CEO, or it might even be tweets or social media updates by firms, right? But the bottom line is, that it's some sort of firm level data. So it wouldn't make sense to work with macro aggregate level data if you're trying to determine whether the positivity of firms matters. If, on the other hand, your hypothesis is something about whether or not um, you know, the economy is in a state of panic, then, of course, it's unlikely that the most relevant data is firm level data, right? Because we're now thinking about things in the aggregate terms. And so a large sample of news articles would probably be a better uh, and more relevant data source vis-a-vis -vis firm level annual reports, for instance. And so again, the key takeaway really is that you want to let the hypotheses drive the choice of data that you work with. Now, once you have your relevant data, it's then a case of cleaning that text data. And the importance of this particular step really cannot be emphasized enough. There's a term called GIGO, uh, which is quite important in you know, data science or any sort of analysis that you're working with, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. Right? So GIGO or garbage in, garbage out is essentially saying if your data is garbage, so if your data is rubbish, i.e. the data is not clean or the data is not usable or the data is fundamentally flawed, if your data is garbage, then it doesn't matter how good your model is or how sophisticated the model is, the results from your analysis will almost certainly be garbage, right? So if the data is garbage, then the outputs are going to be garbage as well, right? So if the input is garbage, then the output is garbage. So garbage in, garbage out, guy go. And so again, I really can't stress the importance of cleaning the text data. And indeed, as a result of cleaning the text data well, the additional incremental benefit is that you really know and fully understand the data that you're working with, which is imperative to conducting any sort of half decent analysis. Okay, so you've created your testable hypotheses, you've let the hypotheses drive the choice of data that you work with, and then you've obsessively cleaned the data. The next thing you can do is perhaps the most fun part which in the context of sentiment analysis is actually estimating these sentiment measures, right? So it's at this stage where we can actually quantify things like the positivity of firms or negativity or uncertainty or indeed any other type of sentiment or emotion. And once we've got this estimate of sentiment for a firm or a set of firms or indeed the aggregate economy, then we can go back to finally testing and validating the original hypotheses, right? So we've now got a measure of sentiment and then we can test empirically or statistically whether or not that measure of sentiment matters. And once we've validated the sentiment measure, then and only then can we proceed to conducting some sort of investment analysis. Right, so exploiting the measure of sentiment that we now know works and that we now know matters. All right, hopefully all of this makes sense. If any part of this video is not quite clear, especially the part about the five-step process to conducting sentiment analysis, then please do re-watch the video uh, before moving on any further. For now though, just a quick summary. We learned that sentiment analysis, at least in finance, essentially involves quantifying and then exploiting sentiment or indeed emotions for some sort of investment objective. The fundamental idea is to start with a testable hypothesis 
on whether or not some sort of sentiment matters, and then statistically test and validate that core hypothesis before then moving on to things like investment analysis, i.e. using that sentiment for investment purposes. Lastly, of course, we talked about the five-step sentiment analysis process. It's a sort of systematic approach or the ideal approach we could use to conduct sentiment analysis in a rigorous and robust manner. Importantly though, do remember that the real world isn't quite so systematic or indeed organized, right? So the real world is in fact chaotic and you know, that's the beauty of working in the real world, right? That's the beauty of working with real world data. It's chaotic, it's messy, it's exciting. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of unknowns. And so you really do wanna embrace and enjoy the chaos, but at the same time, you wanna have some sort of order. And so although conducting real world analyses is quite messy, it's important to have some sort of idea as to where exactly you are in the overall process for analysis in general, but especially so in the context of sentiment analysis, because otherwise it's akin to just running around like headless chickens. All right, hopefully all of this makes sense. That's enough from me for now. Have a go at the quiz and I'll see you in the next video.